Across the Danganronpa series, we've been introduced to characters like Byakuya Tsukami and Nagito Kamaeda, who both share similar roles within their respective games. Kokichi, similar to Byakuya and Nagito, shares a similar role to both these characters, but compared to Byakuya and Nagito, whose presence only feels to add a dash of chaos to the story and trials, which Kokichi also does, it's hard not to feel like there's a lot more nuance to Kokichi's character in comparison. Yet, this is also what has led to him becoming such a controversial character in the first place. Despite his popularity, I've always felt his arc in V3 and how they tie him with his actual motivations and actions are highly misunderstood. The worst offender of these misunderstandings, I feel, is that Kokichi is some sort of uncaring sociopath that only cares about winning the killing game. While it's pretty easy to believe, I think it misses the point entirely of what was truly going through his head and what he was trying to achieve. When initially introduced, Kokichi already muddies the waters with what is and isn't a lie, by outright stating that he's a liar, right after introducing himself as the ultimate supreme leader of a secret organization, for immediately claiming afterwards that he's telling the truth about his talent, which naturally confuses Kaede on whether or not he's even being honest. This is emblematic of Kokichi's character being dictated by what truth and lies you find in his dialogue. Does he really see himself as a supreme leader, or is that just what he wants you to believe? Although given the nature of his introduction, it's easy for Kaede to immediately brush Kokichi off as nothing more than just a mischievous kid. Chapter 2 is where Kokichi begins to show signs of his understanding of the killing game and the dynamic between Monokuma and the students. Early on in the chapter, when everyone is forcing conversation and trying to ignore the deaths of Kaede and Rantaro, and after talking about being able to stop Monokuma if they simply cooperate, Kokichi makes an offhand remark claiming that it's that exact mentality that lets Monokuma manipulate them. This shows that Kokichi is clearly aware of the dynamic of the killing game and Monokuma's true methods of inciting murder, and this only shows how quickly he's grown tired of the other students and how easily they continue to get manipulated by Monokuma. However, Kokichi also uses this to his advantage, to give himself an edge in the killing game, and is what leads to his later manipulation of Gonta, since he is definitely the most naive student in the academy. But we'll get into that later. This edge isn't simply just a win, but also plays into his plan to eventually expose the mastermind and end the killing game. Later on, as part of the new motive, videos of loved ones by the remaining cast are spread randomly to each student, when the videos were received, everyone beside Kokichi and Ryoma had unanimously agreed not to exchange them out of fear that it may lead to another murder. Kokichi agrees with Ryoma before clarifying that they shouldn't stop caring about killing or dying, but that he thinks it's best that they don't work together. He justifies this with the actions of Monokuma and how whenever they try to work together, Monokuma would retaliate with a plan to make them suffer more. Using Kaede's death as an example of their cooperation ultimately working against them and making things worse in the end, also possibly referring to the death route to despair. He also uses this to justify messing with others, but when Shuichi asks him if he is lying about his justification, Kokichi responds saying it doesn't matter, since regardless of how you look at it, he's right that forcing people to work together will only cause them more suffering. Clarifying that the action in itself isn't bad, but it's ultimately better to just leave everyone to their own thing. During the class trial, Kokichi becomes even more frustrated with their cooperation and outright states how cowardly he thinks it is, and that the best way to weed out a killer is to corner them psychologically and wait for them to break or mess up and reveal an inconsistency in their testimony. Then you have to corner them psychologically. Only then will they reveal their true self as a liar! HIDING BENEATH A LAYER OF DECEIT! If we want to find the liar, I suggest that the two suspects argue against each other. No more pointless deductions. All we need is for them to fight for their lives! So let's host an argument that's totally not boring but super fun! Look at the culprit in their lies when we find a contradiction. We'll scare the culprit until they screw up! That's how a true class trial works. Right, Monokuma? He displays even more frustration towards Kaido's response when Kokichi applies this logic to incite this type of hostile debate 
between Maki and Kaito, as they were the last remaining suspects before Kaito confidently claims that he believes neither him or Maki are the culprit, purely based on a hunch. Then what would be the point of this whole debate? Who cares about that? All I know is that neither me or Maki are the culprit. It's just a hunch I've got. Uh, a hunch? Are you being serious? You do know all our lives are on the line here, right? And you're betting our lives on just a hunch? Kokiji's point is ultimately proven when Kurumi is revealed as the killer of Ryuma at the end of Chapter 2. Her murder was purely encouraged by the motive video she had received, which out of pure coincidence was her own. And if others had known of her role as Japan's de facto prime minister, then suddenly the murder of Ryuma would have become much less likely as everyone would have been much more cautious and observant of Kurumi, knowing she had a very justifiable excuse to kill. At the very end of the class trial after Kurumi's execution, Kokichi makes a very interesting statement, which foreshadows his meticulously crafted plan to outplay the mastermind of the killing game. Um... Because... To contextualize this, this is where I'd say Kokichi's plans of outplaying the mastermind and truly trying to fool the other students into believing or suspecting him to be the mastermind truly begin to take shape which I'll get into shortly, however I have a few more things I'd like to talk about before I do. As discussed earlier, he believes cooperation only results in more suffering, and continues to use the deaths of Kaede and Rantaro as an example of that. And ironically in Clash Trials, his lies seem almost like indicators for people in Shuichi's position as an underhanded tactic to steer the debate into a direction that he personally believes will ultimately lead to the truth. This explains his insistence to force the suspects, Kaitsu and Maki, into a hostile debate and waiting for one of them to slip up in their testimonies, and further explains why he becomes so frustrated when Kaitsu refuses to believe neither him or Maki are the culprit, despite having no evidence to prove so. Because Kaitsu refuses to let Kokichi steer the debate simply out of spite. At the end of Chapter 3, after Korekio's execution, he even puts Himiko on the spot for lying. Upon hearing this, Himiko goes silent and recalls a memory of Tanku before the seance, saying, And upon facing these emotions, and coming to terms with them, Himiko begins to burst out in tears, exclaiming how lonely she is, without Tanko and Angie, but that she has to survive, and that she can't die and go to where they are yet. And, I believe this is a sign of Kokichi oddly displaying compassion towards Himiko in his own strange and indirect way. Looking back at when I said Kokiji began his plans of deceiving everyone by making them believe that he is a malevolent person and ultimately the mastermind, I can further this claim with the fact that Kokiji had made many offhand comments which directly insinuate that he knows more than he lets on, which I will show here. Shuichi even picks up on many of these comments, but every time Shuichi or somebody else asks what he means, Kokichi either asks to be ignored or claims his comment was just a lie, and in a sense, they definitely are just lies, but his intention with these lies are to obviously mislead the others, and particularly Shuichi, about his relation with the killing game, Monokuma, and the Mastermind. To explain further, Kokichi begins to act more antagonistic, especially in Chapter 4, where he begins to seemingly glorify the killing game and openly express his desire to win, even going as far as saying if becoming the Blackened is what it takes to win, then he's completely okay with going to that extreme. 
Although this obviously outwardly contradicts what he says in chapter 2, as he clearly seems to care about minimizing the amount of suffering everyone has to go through by not forcing everybody to cooperate. This clear and distinct shift in personality is something only Kokichi can get away with. Everybody already views him as the most untrustworthy person in the academy. Hence, when he begins to act more antagonistic, nobody really questions it. Although Kaito does punch him during this scene, claiming, Kokichi, what the hell's gotten into you? You were messed up to begin with, but this is a whole nother level of weird. If you keep acting like this, I'm gonna knock your senses back into you! Um, you already hit him. Kaito, please stop. There is never a good reason to commit violence. Even minor aggressions can lead to atrocities such as murder. Afterwards, stating that he hopes his little speech was just a lie. So even though Kaito doesn't necessarily question this shift in personality, he definitely notices it and promptly lets out his frustration about it on him over it. He also begins to obfuscate the horse A hint left for Rantaro by Monokuma as a perk for winning the previous killing game, by gradually turning it into This World Is Mine, Kokichi Oma by the end of chapter 4, which with little room for misinterpretation, can only mean he's the mastermind. Although this already sort of pays off during chapter 4's trial, as almost everyone unanimously agrees that Kokichi is just like Monokuma in the middle of it. Kokichi even has a rendezvous with Monokuma around the middle of chapter 4, proposing to use the keycard motive in a more dramatic way, and while he's at it, even convincing Monokuma and hence convincing the mastermind that Kokichi is a malevolent and evil person, all according to his own plan. At the beginning of chapter 4, there was some semblance of truth to his words when he said he'd do anything to win the killing game. Although it's not to win the game, as it's intended to be won, but to rather outplay the mastermind and ruin the killing game ultimately making the mastermind lose. By now, Kakichi's plan is already in full motion, and has already taken extreme measures to make sure his plan plays out exactly how he wanted to. To refer back to Kokichi's rendezvous with Monokuma, on his intention to use the keycard motive in a more dramatic way by actually going out of his way to convince Monokuma to reuse the keycard motive from the third chapter inside the virtual world of Mew tampered with, Kokichi is already prepared to set up Gonta as this chapter is blackened. He uses the motive to manipulate Gonta into mercy killing Mew after discovering the secret of the outside world. After this goes exactly to plan and Mew's body is discovered, Kokichi insists that Shuichi should not investigate with Kaito as Shuichi is the most reliable person in a class trial and Kaito might use him to cover himself in the context that Kaito is the blackened. As Kaito was the primary suspect of Mew's murder at the time, Ironically, this is simply so Kikichi can do exactly what he warned Shuichi what Kaito would do. Since the trial could easily lead to Kokichi being the primary suspect of Mew's murder, and Kokichi knowing that Gonta is the true black and slowly tries to direct Shuichi to that exact conclusion, that Gonta is the true black and not only to save Kokichi's own skin, but so he can eventually forward his plan into its final phase, having even the mastermind fooled of his true intentions. During the trial, when Kokichi pins Gonta as the true killer of Mew, he becomes highly frustrated when Kaito insists that Kokichi is the killer of Mew, despite him proving countless times that he couldn't have killed Mew inside of the virtual world. This also met with Gonta not being able to recall his memories from the virtual world due to a glitch, which frustrated Kokichi even more. As Gota genuinely insists he did not murder Mew, totally oblivious to the fact that he simply forgot he did, he comes off as even more believable to the other students. Kokichi faced with unfair and biased prosecution, despite showing the others extremely convincing evidence that Gonta is the killer, begins to complain about this unfair dynamic in the class trials, being accused of murder despite showing evidence saying he clearly couldn't. While the true killer and the evidence presented that points towards them gets ignored due to sheer bias. That is, until Shuichi himself intervenes and defends Kokichi's innocence. While explaining in detail why Gonta could have been the only person who could kill Mew, by now the trial is over and everyone has reluctantly voted for Gonta, besides Kaito who stubbornly voted for Kokichi, refusing to believe that Gonta is the killer 
no matter the circumstance. After Monokuma creates the Gonta Alter Ego, an AI of Gonta that holds the memories he lost and had him explain that he killed Mui because of the secret of the outside world. Kokichi begins to cry, asking to be killed in Gonta's place, and that if Mui didn't add a setting to his virtual world avatar that paralyzed him when she touched her, he would have killed Mui himself, instead of having Gonta do it for him. This moment by the large majority of people is generally viewed as empty words and crocodile tears due to Kokichi's reaction straight after. But on the contrary to that belief, I believe there's more to what I believe is his facade of not caring about essentially being directly responsible for Gota committing a murder. Because before he does this, Kaito directly insists to Kokichi that if he truly cared about Gota, you would tell us the secret of the outside world in his place. But remember that the secret of the outside world is a vital part of Kokichi's plan in convincing everybody that he is, in fact, the mastermind. And upon hearing this, it almost feels forced, and like him not caring about Gonta is a simple excuse for him to not let up vital information that gives him an edge over everybody else and the mastermind. During the scene, he is fully shifted into the evil persona he wants people to believe is his true personality and intent, rather than who he truly is. And by insisting that because he is the ultimate supreme leader, then obviously his personality will be twisted. And once more, glorifying the killing game, now going as far as the instance that he derives entertainment from the suffering of the other students, which once more contradicts his actions in Chapter 2, due to Kokichi's only amped up his evil persona to 100 at this particular moment to hide his true intention with what he wanted to do with the information Kaito had specifically asked him for. There are many instances where I feel Kokichi also expresses a frustration that somebody like Shuichi, who he evidently thinks to be one of the few trustworthy people in the killing game, spent so much time with somebody like Kaito. Even asking Shuichi to be his partner instead and taking on that sort of partner role during Chapter 4 in place of Kaito. By Chapter 5, everyone is fully convinced that Kokichi is not to be trusted. Justifiably, they go as far as to be skeptical and doubtful when Kokichi presents the Electro Hammers and Electro Bombs. Weapons that disable electronic devices and can be used to fight against Monokuma and Exosols. Although he specifically requested Mew to create for that specific purpose, he actually intends to use the Electro Bombs to execute the final step of his plan to ruin the killing game. He recalls an anecdote of requesting Mew to create the Electro Hammers and specifically calls back to a moment where Mew claims um. Then using this anecdote to then say No. Yeah. Kokichi is definitely manipulating them by using their own mindset to encourage them to fight against Monokuma, using the Electro Hammers to destroy the traps in the Death Road of Despair. This event acting as bait to lure everyone into discovering the truth of the outside world and also making them waste the battery on the Electro Hammers, he also insists on keeping the Electro Hammers for himself. This is to distract them and the Mastermind from the true role the Electro Bombs play in Kokichi's grand scheme to ruin the killing game and outplay the Mastermind. When everyone arrives at the end of the tunnel, they discover the truth behind the Academy. Kokichi arrives and shuts the door to prevent everyone from suffocating to death, 
and begins to explain to them that they have been hibernating for a few hundred years in a space colony that was intended to head towards a habitable planet and what they just saw was the ruins of an Earth decimated by meteors and devoid of any life or oxygen. He explains that the colony failed because the creators of the Gopher Project had made an oversight and allowed the leader of the cult organization behind the ultimate hunt inside the colony without realizing it, that leader being Kokichi himself. Kokichi Dan uses this to convince everybody that he truly is the perpetrator behind the killing game. He convinces them further by grabbing a remote that lets him control the Exiles. Much to Kipo's confusion, he asks how he's controlling them if only the Monocubs could control the Exiles. He says obviously he'd be able to control them because he's the mastermind, and that he's full of control over everything in the colony due to the master remote control. This is the final straw that breaks the camel's back, and now everybody is convinced without a doubt that Kokichi truly is the mastermind. He then expresses his disappointment that Shuichi could not discern he was the true mastermind from the graffiti left in the rock alone, saying, Is it? Maybe. And starts to use his previous sentiment of not forcing people to work together by twisting it, and saying he simply just wanted everyone to doubt each other more, and that they could have realized he was the mastermind earlier and caused less victims, and that Kaede had the right idea when she tried to kill the mastermind. And to add the final nail to the coffin, two days later, Maki discovers the final flashback light, and within it would contain their final lost memories about Hope's Peak Academy and the remnants of despair and would come to the conclusion that the, that the cult organization Kokichi was in charge of was the remnants of despair, and accordingly came to the conclusion that Kokichi was the new ultimate despair in place of Junko and Oshima. Both were linked with the killing game as a whole, and just like the previous killing games, it was a battle of hope and despair. However, the first hole in this conclusion is brought up by Maki, where she wonders that since the killing game is so important to the remnants of despair and Kokichi, why did he abandon it so quickly? Sumugi quickly shuts her down and claiming oh, Although this is nothing more than conjecture and speculation, Maki even seems to believe so, and when Shuichi notices her in a contemplative position and asks her what's wrong, she claims she's merely not convinced, but then proceeds to dismiss this assuming it's probably nothing. Despite this, Shuichi asks if she's sure she should dismiss her suspicions so easily, but then Tsumugi immediately changes the subject and steers it into there being no hope left for us, thus leading Kibo to contradict her, claiming there is hope and that they should not submit to despair, which as we'll learn in chapter 6, is exactly what she wanted. Shuichi is even convinced by all this talk of hope. Maki has no comment during this, Shuichi himself even inadvertently makes a contradiction that would validate Maki's suspicions even more. When Kipu says, What exactly does Kokichi gain from giving them the flashback light if he has nothing to gain from it? But within this context that Kokichi is in the mastermind, it starts to give you a different idea of why exactly it was placed there. And this plays into another thing I'll get into in a moment. We now reach the final stretch of Kokichi's ultimate plan, restoring hope in such a dire situation and everybody is prepared to fight back against Kokichi and save Kaito for being imprisoned inside the Exosol hangar, using the Electro Hammers to disable the Exosols and render Kokichi powerless. After using an Electro Bomb to disable the alarm system and enter the Exosol hangar, much to their shock, instead of Kokichi and the Exosols waiting for them there, they instead find an unidentifiable dead body crushed beyond recognition by the hydraulic press, and the power of the press being cut making it impossible for them to lift the press and identify the clothing of the deceased. Upon the discovery, the bell rings and Monokuma reappears, after vanishing ever since Kokichi revealed himself as the mastermind, and as usual, he does a body discovery announcement. Given both Kaitsu and Kokichi were the only ones locked inside the Exosol hangar, 
they come to the conclusion that the victim could only have been Kaito or Kokichi. And then many begin to assume that since the killing game is continuing, then Kaito must be the person who died as killing the mastermind, who they believe is Okichi, would have ended the killing game. Upon investigation, however, they finally come across Kokichi's clothes stuffed down a toilet. The clothes were dirty and covered in crossbow bolts, insinuating that Kokichi was attacked. Shuichi then begins to consider the possibility that the person crushed in the hydraulic press could have been Kokichi. Thus, this evidence makes the identity of both the victim and the killer much more ambiguous and hard to discern. But if Kokichi is dead, how could the killing game possibly be continuing if he is without a doubt the mastermind? To add insult to injury, when the final trial begins, instead of the killer entering as themselves, they enter piloting one of the Axisols and use voice modifiers implemented within the Axisol to sound both like Kokichi and Kaito. Herein lies the beauty of the plan's final act, but also its greatest flaw, which ultimately becomes its own downfall at the very last step of this plan. The intention from the start is to make the killer totally ambiguous and impossible to prove entirely, as all the evidence leading to both answers run into a dead end, and back to where everybody started, where the only victim and culprit could have been Kokichi and Kaito. Kokichi comes to the realization that they are being watched, as is everything they do. He believes that the killing game is being broadcast to at least somebody for entertainment, leading to this absolute confidence in this plan. Since the game is being broadcast, Monokuma is completely constricted by the rules of the killing game. Kokichi realizes this and knows well that if his plan succeeds, it will finally end the killing game and the mastermind will be totally outplayed. As what right does Monokuma have to kill everybody else if he himself doesn't even know the identity of the killer and the victim himself? To achieve this, Kokichi uses the Axisols he gained control of over to patrol around Monokuma, making absolutely sure that he can't observe the crime scene himself, as he cannot externally because Kokichi had used an electro bomb to disable any hidden surveillance present within the Axisol hangar. After a scuffle with Maki, Kaito and Kokichi both get shot with poisonous arrows, Kaito's injury being an accident. Maki then rushes to Shuichi's research lab to get the antidote to the poison she used on the crossbow bolts and hurries back to give the antidote to Kaito. However, Kokichi takes the poison and then pretends to drink it himself. Kaito tells her to run, but in a rage, she makes a failed attempt to enter the Axisol hangar, but eventually gives up and rushes back to her room. After this happens, Kokichi hands Kaito the antidote and then begins to incorporate what just happened into his plan by blackmailing Kaito. He explains his plan to Kaito, and Kaito is with no other choice but to go along with it and kill Kokichi for the plan. Because if he did not, Kokichi would eventually succumb to poison, which would make Maki to block him, ultimately saving Maki in the end. During the trial, the goal is to fool Monokuma into thinking either Maki or Kokichi are the culprit. As in reality, he doesn't have a clue who actually is the culprit. But Monokuma, out of spite, begins to intervene in the trial and rides on Shuichi's deduction to determine the true killer. Shuichi comes to the conclusion that the culprit must have been Kaitsu, but during this, he begins to realize that Kaito must be running the plan for a good reason, because he wants to see if everybody end the killing game. Realizing this, Shuichi at the last second begins to lie and then pretends that the person inside the Axisol is Kokichi, and he was solely playing along with Kokichi's plan to fool Monokuma but just couldn't keep up with it. This is where the true identity of the person inside the Axisol is revealed to be Kaito, as by this rate, Kaito would fear that if they got the killer wrong, Monokuma got it right, he would have the complete right to kill them all without breaking the rules of the killing game. The true motivation of Kokichi is made clear by his last words. Kaito notices a contradiction in his logic and asks him why he's really doing any of this if he loves the killing game so much. Kokichi responds saying, <sighs> Although by the end, it's painted as ambiguous as to whether or not he truly meant what he said. 
Based on his actions in earlier chapters, expressing sympathy towards the likes of Gunta and Himiko, and in Chapter 6, Slater, when he leaves his will behind to help the remaining students find the final clue to Rantaro's research lab if his plan ultimately fails, leads me to believe this was a genuine reaction during his final moments. It's very easy to look at Kokichi on a very surface level and assume he was nothing more than a sociopathic genius who was willing to go to any extent to win the killing game. And while the latter half of that statement is true, it's only within the context of how he defines winning, as during the trial itself, although not expressed directly by him but by Kaito, he is still reading off a script that Kokichi wrote for him for the trial claiming that he doesn't care about winning the killing game itself and subsequently hates the killing game and the people running it. And his idea of a true victory is destroying the killing game with a plan to make Monokuma break his own rules. And if not for Kaito, this plan would have worked flawlessly. Kokichi's guilt with ultimately being the one responsible for Gonta murdering Mew is furthered within the context that he viewed both their deaths as necessary sacrifices to ending the killing game and saving more lives than what the game itself intends. During Chapter 5, while he is also introducing the Electro Hammers and Electro Bombs, he also expresses a level of sadness that would be weird to lie about in that given moment. After Maki grabs him by the neck and friends to kill him, he says, What? Now moving on directly onto the subject of Chapter 6, it is discovered that Kokichi himself was never a remnant of despair, and that the true mastermind of the killing game, as I have hinted earlier, is Sumugi Shirogane. During the final trial, Sumugi lies and furthers his theory that Kokichi truly was a remnant of despair. However, Kokichi's motive video from Chapter 2 directly contradicts this baseless conjecture, as it reveals that Kokichi was actually the leader of an organization called DICE and that its members were the most important people to him in his life. Though instead of 10,000 members as he claimed originally, it only had 10 members, and that they were less so criminals and more so pranksters who just committed petty, harmless crimes at most. Due to this, they also come to the realization that a lot of memories they had restored revolving around Kokichi were inconsistent with the evidence they had found that proved that he wasn't a remnant of despair. There are also some objections I want to rise towards other misconceptions revolving around Kokichi, and forgive me if this section comes off as a little bit ranty. I'd like to start with this analysis video made by Weeby News, made for Kokichi. Uh, so, and just to clarify, this is not an attack of any sort on her as a person, but more so the heavy flaws I see in her analysis. With that being put out of the way, because I had to clarify, uh, the first thing I'll point out is her claim of Kokichi coming from a troubled background, of which it was often necessary to lie purely to get by. The issue I have with this is primarily that it's entirely conjecture and not really an actual analysis of his characterization revolving around his lies. And there's really no evidence at all in the game itself to actually prove a claim like that. I also think fixating on translations and fan translations for such a sizable portion of the video wasn't exactly a good idea, especially since in the end they come to the same conclusion anyways, that he's still saying the same thing about hitting the killing game and those responsible for it. If you're going to make an analysis on a character, please don't make half-baked random theories entrenched in circumstantial and baseless evidence and instead have your analysis actually be grounded on an actual basis on what actually happens in the games. Another thing that bothers me with Kokichi's critics is how often they tend to interject their own morality into why they think he's a bad character. I hate to say this, but just because you could subjectively argue that Kokichi is a bad person doesn't necessarily coincide with them being badly written. Kokichi didn't sacrifice others for no reason, given his disposition, and in my opinion, it can be discerned that Kokichi is not comfortable with making these decisions, as evident with his reaction to the death of Gonta. 
But in his mind, if no one else will make these decisions, then ultimately the outcome will be worse if he did not make these decisions. He must be the bad guy if nobody else will. And although he is still selfish to an extent, that selfishness is not displaced. Given the extreme extent he's willing to go to follow through with his plans of ending the killing game by making his own life the final sacrifice to enact the final act of his plan in Chapter 5, which without Kaito's intervention very well could have ended the killing game once and for all, letting Kaito, Maki, Sumugi, Shuichi, Kibo, and Himiku escape instead of the comparably small number of survivors the game required to end, which was only two people. But you need to remember, when it comes to things like this, these are fictional characters who are written the way they are for a reason. Using your own moral righteousness as a foundation for why you think a character is bad, I feel is a lazy and shallow reason. If everyone else used their moral righteousness as a basis to criticize everything they didn't like, then even characters like Griffith from Berserk, as an example, would likely be universally viewed as some of the worst written characters in anime or media as a whole. I'm not entirely sure how I want to conclude this, but I would like to say that the most prevalent issue in how people view Oma is, as a character is that they don't really think about it deeply and generally can't seem to tell the difference between a character that's done bad things and a character who is badly written. Kokichi's warped morality, in contrast with your generic, mass-produced, overly idealistic and altruistic characters, and one-dimensional villains with no aspirations or motives outside of simply being evil, not only leads to being able to explore more interesting concepts and flesh out a character more sufficiently to make them more interesting, it's in many ways even more easier to understand than your everyday insane evil protagonist who is uncompromising in their own moral code and typically tend to never get any real development as a result. That being done and dusted, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. A lot of time and work went into this and it's the first time I've ever really made something like this. And with that being said, thank you for watching.